Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. This morning, I want to introduce a friend of mine. Pastor Frank Lopez is wonderful. He's our guest speaker this morning. He's not going to be our guest speaker tomorrow because he's going over to the Spanish-speaking services tomorrow at 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock. So he has one of the great, most powerful uh, and anointed churches in Miami Beach, Florida. And it's just so amazing. Deborah, when she's preached there a couple of times, comes back. I tell you, it's like crazy for like three, four, five days. She loves these guys so much. Every time we sit down, I get up in the morning, have coffee. Debbie sits down. She's talking about how fabulous their church is, how wonderful Frank is, how wonderful Zeta is, how just how powerful their music is. Uh, Jorge is just the, and the music is like all over the place. And they're so wonderful. And I just, you know, I kind of feel like I want to go out and shoot myself that I haven't done very good in the ministry at all after listening to Deborah brag about uh, the church in Miami. And it's a Spanish-speaking service, even though they've just started an English-speaking service, too, because they're growing so much. So here we are, English reaching out to Spanish. They're Spanish reaching out to the English. And if you've ever been in Miami, you can figure that out. When you enter in the airport, they say, como esta? Like, what did you just say? This is America. How do I know what that means? And so anyway, it is wonderful. Frank is the only man in my life that I allow to hold my hand. No, it's true. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kind of like a, um, I'm, I, I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Can you see me walking around holding hands with another man? It just doesn't work for me, you know what I mean? But Frank's the only one I will let hold my hand. Here's why. Not too long ago, Debbie was preaching at his church. She meets a boxer, a famous boxer from Cuba, who is named Gamboa. He is like ch world champion, never lost a fight. So they have a picture. She texts me while she's there in Miami of Debbie and Gamboa. And she says, my new friend Gamboa, and he wants you to come to the Pacquiao fight and Marquez fight in Las Vegas and pray for him. He's, the, he's on right before Pacquiao is, the world championship fight there. And, uh, and I like boxing, you know, I, I, I really like boxing. I like boxing from my living room. I'm not sure I like boxing in an arena. There's kind of like weird stuff goes on in an arena, you know. So anyway, we go to meet Gamboa. He's, he's on the card that night. He's the second fight before Pacquiao. And this is all foreign to me. I mean, I have never been in a situation like this. Well, immediately when we get there, we're, we're hustled to his room. We will go to his room, and he's in the, what, what was the name of that hotel? It was uh, MGM Grand Hotel. And so we're, he's in this big old room, you know, at the MGM Grand, and, and he says, take your clothes off. And it's like, what is this? You know, I, I'm a pastor. This ain't going to happen, you know. And he says, so they want us to, so they made us put on these sweat outfits that says Team Gamboa on it. So, and then gave us wristbands so that we could go into the ring. And into the, so we're going to be in the dressing room. Team Gamboa is on Pastor's back and on Pastor Frank's back. And all of these famous people are coming in. Uh, Mitt Romney is coming in. All of these famous movie stars are coming in. Some dude named 50 Cent is there. I don't know whatever happened to his other 50 cents, but he was shy of a buck there, I'm sure. And uh, so he came. I mean, lots of these famous people are coming in. And, and I'm sitting there as this pastor who is in this world of the church, in this different world. In, inside of the dressing rooms and all of these famous people and, and they're getting his hands wrapped and, and he doesn't, I prayed for him, me and Frank prayed for him. Is this not true, Frank? The Spirit of God fell, I, for like a month I'm saying, how do I pray for a, how do I pray for a boxer? What do I pray, God? God, let him kick the crap out of the other guy. I mean, what do I say to the pastor? You know what I'm saying? I didn't know how to pray for, for this guy. Well, when he, he comes to me in his room and he says, pray for me. The spirit of 
God fell on the place. I mean, is that not true, Frank? I mean, you could, you could walk on the Spirit of God. It was so thick in the place, and words just burst out, just burst out of me. From that moment on, he wouldn't let Frank and I out of his sight. So when we're entering into the arena, there's 18,000 people like going crazy, right? This is a world championship fight. 18,000 people. It's like going into a glass, a gladiator going into the Colosseum. I felt like the same way. I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm a man of God. Raise my hands and lo- voice to the Lord. And here's all these people. Are, eh, eh, eh. I'm going. And so I'm like petrified. And I'm, and I'm behind. And it's only Gamboa, Pastor Frank, and me that are allowed to go in. And so we're behind Gamboa. Do we have that picture? And we're coming into the arena. So there's Pastor Frank, there's me, and there's the champ right there. I am petrified. All of a sudden, as I'm coming in, someone, I mean, I'm petrified. There's 18,000 people. Put that back up. There's 18,000 people. And I'm, I got this smile on my face. And you can see the, see the little um, uh, wristband right there, a wristband. That means I get to go in the ring and all that kind of stuff. It was, it's just like crazy. I'm out of my element. I'm out of everything. And all of a sudden, to calm me down, Pastor Frank grabs my hand. <laughs> and he walks me in. And I'm behind him. At this particular point, my hand's up there, but in a moment, he's going to grab my hand and help me because I'm like, oh, my God. You see the expression on my face? It's like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? So Pastor Frank says, did you have a good time? The answer to that is absolutely not. Paid, Paid review, man, 50 bucks, stay home. And I was amazed. I said to Frank, I said, Frank, I didn't hear any cussing or swearing or anything. And he says, that's because you don't speak Spanish. (laughs) Usually, you know, so I just had a ball. So Frank Frank is my dear friend. He's part of this ministry. I'm in love with him. Deborah's in love with him. They're dear friends. She told me that no church has ever taken care of her better than Frank and Zeta's church in Miami, that all of the years of traveling, she was taken care of and had dear friends and just loves them very, very much. I want you to stand to your feet. Give the Lord a great big praise for Pastor Frank Lopez. Pastor Frank, will you come and tell us about Jesus? Love you, my friend. (laughs) Thank you. I'll hold your hand on the way up. Good morning. You may be seated. It is such an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, a few years ago, we came here, uh, Dr. Baring and Lisa, which we love so much. They invited us to a pastor's conference, and immediately we fell in love with this church. This is our church, too. That's why I'm wearing this. My wife and I, we belong to this church, even though we're in Miami. And uh, it was so funny because we got lost. We were lost and we were going there and there, everywhere. We ended up in a university. And all of a sudden, we were in the parking lot here. And when we got in the parking lot, we felt the presence of God. And I said, Saida, if, we, if this is not the church, we're very close to the church. Because we felt the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus. We felt it in the parking lot in your chairs right there. And that's how we knew that we were in the right place. You are in the right place. This is the house of the Lord. This is holy ground. And we just love your pastors. I mean, uh, Pastor Jim is such an example to all of us. And uh, I respect him so much. When he asked me to come and preach, I said, I don't know. Are you sure about that? Because I have so much respect for this house. And your pastor, Deborah, she's my favorite preacher in the whole world. She is, and she's on fire. She inspires us. And everybody from Doral said, tell Pastor Deborah to come back. Tell him to come back. Okay, I'll tell her. Let's see what happens. Let's pray, all right? Father, we just thank you for this moment. And we thank you so much for this honor and this privilege. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, that it will be you teaching your people. This is your house, and this is your people. And I just want to be your instrument. So I just submit to you right now. And 
Let every word that come out of my mouth, not mine, but yours. And I ask, Lord, that a conviction will be in our heart that this is your word and that you are a good God and that you have plans for all of us, not only here on earth, but in eternity too. So we just honor you, Jesus, in this moment. And we declare that this is your time. We declare that this is your moment to, to exalt your son, Father. Exalt Jesus, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the word that I have for you guys. It's, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And I press, pray so much for this, for this day that it got to a moment that God says, don't pray anymore for it. Okay, I didn't pray anymore for it. And then I got this word. And it's about persistence. I got it and it was 11 o'clock at night. I was watching TV and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came into my heart and says persistent. Tell them about persistence. So I go into the scripture in the book of Luke chapter 11 verse 9. It says, and I said unto you, ask and it shall be given to you. This is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus talking. He says, if you ask, it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks, received. And he that seeks, finds. And to him that knocked, it shall be opened. So Jesus is teaching his followers about persistence. You know, God is not in the business of getting a crowd together and getting just believers. God is in the business of getting true followers, disciples People that will love him, people that will obey him, people that will serve him, people that will exalt his name. And to those, he's teaching about the principle of persistence. Now, persistence is, is action that continues until you get the breakthrough. It's something that you have to do over and over again. It has to do with occurrence. It has to do with the continuing, continuing an action. It's not perseverance. Perseverance is when you make a decision to stay on course. Persistent is what you do while you persevere. It's not a, okay, I have decided to follow Jesus. Okay, but what are you going to do about it? It's not just a decision to follow Jesus. It's a daily action that shows that you, your decision to follow Jesus is alive. Persistence. Persistence has to do with the repetition. You know, you're, you, you continue on it until, until something happens. It's like in baseball, you know, pers perseverance is when you have decided to play baseball. Persistent is when you keep swinging the bat, even though you haven't hit the ball yet, but you keep swinging. You keep swinging until you hit a home run. Persistence. Say persistence. You know, God is teaching about persistence. It's so important uh, in Revelation th uh, chapter 3, verse 21. If we can get it up there. Uh, Revelation 3, chapter 21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. So persistence will bring authority overcome is talking about that one that's the estate making what he's supposed to be making doing what he's supposed to be doing persistence and and it's talking about that you will be granted a position in, in his throne he's talking about authority you know uh, uh, but jesus was persistence uh, the reason that he got to the cross is because one day at a time he was doing what he was supposed to be doing it's not that he just persevere staying waiting for his opportunity to go to the cross no he persevered in the decision but every day he was doing something about it he was preaching the word he was loving people he was teaching people he was saving people he was healing people he was he was confronting darkness he was defying um, the, the the devil he was doing something about it we have to be a uh, people who persist in our faith you know jesus um finished uh, his vision finishes his um, his uh, purpose because he was persistent. It's one day at a time, one action at a time, and and we must persist. So I'm going to teach today about three things that I felt in my heart that we should all persist. And this is something that I apply in my life. And I look in the scriptures about te Jesus teaching about persistence, and uh, I found this a scripture that is awesome. It's in the book of Luke, uh, chapter. 11 verse 13 uh, we, we just read part of it right now but it's talking about a friend I'm going to paraphrase is that okay because I don't want to go over time he's talking about a friend uh, it's a persistent friend 
And he says, Jesus says that this friend comes to this house at midnight of his friend. And he was knocking at the door. And he was asking for loaf of bread. Because this friend that was knocking had another friend that was coming his way. And he wanted, he wanted to be hospitable. He wanted to be um, useful. He wanted to bless this other friend. So he went to this friend at night. And he knocked and he knocked. And the scripture says that uh, the reason that his friend um, uh, stood up from bed and gave him the bread was because of persistent knocking at the door. Now, there's something important here because he's talking, uh, the Bible is talking about friendship. And friendship with God is so important. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, I'm going with my father. I'm not going to call you disciples anymore. I'm going to call you friends. Because everything about me, you already know it. Friendship in the Bible speaks about true intimacy. You know, when you know the person. The friend came to the house of the other friend. Not because the friend in the house promised him anything. It was not based on any promise. He never said to him. The scripture doesn't say, you know, if you ever need bread or if you ever need whatever, just come to my house and I'll give it to you. That was not the reason. He came to the friend's house to ask for the bread because he knew the friend. He was a friend. And he knew the character. There's some times that you need to persevere trusting Jesus. Not because he has promised you anything. Because you need to know who he is. He is a good God. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. He's a healer. He's a God that will protect you. Sometimes, you know, sometimes life brings stuff that you, you say, where does this come from? Sometimes, I mean, even Christians, my wife and I, by the way, she's here today. Saida, hi. That's my beautiful wife. She's from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rican fire. And there are things that come our way where we say, where does this come from? Where does this come from? And, uh, and, and yes, we love the word of God. We love the word of God. And, and, we, and we pray the word of God every day. That's another thing that you have to be persistent. But there are just things that we trust God because we know who he is. Based on his character. Based on his character. Persist believing in God. Based on who he is. He's a father. He will never let you. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. And he has promised to be with us every single day. And he will be. Because whatever he says, he will accomplish. Because his character is a character you can trust. So in this scripture, I found that this friend was being persistent. Believing that. I know who he is. I know who my friend is. You know, he, he's asleep. He might get mad at me. He, he's comfortable and everything. But if I knock and I know I, I knocked, I know that eventually he will, he will stand up and give me what I need. You know, uh, we must be persistent in trusting the character of God. He's faithful. He's very faithful. And he's such a good God. Sometimes, last night, we were ministering in the Ison Conference in the back room and, and, and with Pastor Diego Mesa. And then the, the word of the Lord came that there was a family there that they were very worried about a child that he was in, with cancer. And then this family came and it turns out that they just lost a son. Um, a few months ago, they lost a son with cancer. I said, oh my God, what am I going into it? How do I pray for this family? You know, three other kids, the wife. The Father, and we just, we, just, we just pray that we trust God no matter what. We trust Him no matter what. Even if it hurts. Even if we cannot find a logic answer. We trust Him because who He is. We must persist no matter what. Trusting our Father because He's a good God. And even we don't understand a lot of things we don't understand. But we still must trust Him. Because his character. And we know that no matter what comes our way, he will turn it around and he will make it work for us. Amen? Say to your neighbor, persistence. Then I look for another scripture. It's in, it's in the book of Luke also. It's about a persistent woman. And this woman comes to, a, to the judge. And uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, okay? Is that okay with you guys? Uh, she, goes to, she comes to the judge and she starts asking for justice. She asks for justice and she asks for justice. 
And she tells her, Joe, listen, I'm not leaving until I'll get justice done. And the judge says, oh, my God, let me, let me do what she wants because, because if not, uh, she's going to bother me so much that she's going to drive me crazy. So the judge grants her because of her persistence. The judge grants her her desire. What is Jesus teaching about this? You know, sometimes problems come our way. And we need to go to the scripture and find exactly the scripture that will help us to go through the problems. Because God is the God of justice. He will do good for us because of who he is. But he will also do good for us because he's the God of justice. And this woman was consistently praying. It was a form of praying. And he was claiming justice to the judge. And the judge eventually said, okay, let's do it because of her persistence. And like George was in the middle of the worship, he was giving a word like some of you have children that are apart from God. Some of you have children that are not serving the Lord. Some of you have children that are rebellious. You know, there's an awesome scripture about it. He has promised that our house, you and your house shall serve the Lord. He has promised that once salvation comes to a life, the whole house will be blessed. You know, in my, in my life, my sister, my older sister, she was the first one to come to Jesus. We are a Cuban family. We came to this country when I was one. And I haven't been able to go back. I'm going back for the first time in my life in two weeks to preach the gospel of Jesus. But I always wanted to go back and they deny me. They deny me the entrance because of my family. I come from a family of politicians. They were involved in, in government a lot. They were involved in getting Castro down. I have uncles that, that were killed uh, by the government. Um, one of my uh, uncle, my mom, was a founder of the Cuban American Foundation in Miami, very powerful organization. And, uh, and I, because, because of that, I was turned out. I was never involved in that, but just because there were my uncles and cousins and stuff like that, they, they didn't let, let me in. But now they do. I'm going back. But the thing is, that, uh, it was a family uh, with hatred in their heart. Vengeance. Oh, you kill my you kill my cousin, you kill my uncle, I'll get you. Unforgiveness. I come from a background of, of um, uh, a lot of idolatry. There was idolatry in my house when I was a little kid because it is the culture of, of, of the island. You know, Catholicism mixed with idolatry. And my sister, my older sister, was the first one that came to Jesus. I remember and the first time she told me about Jesus, I said, she's crazy or what, what is she talking about? And she, all she says is, and you better get ready because I'm going to start praying for you. I said, what? Ready for what? You'll see. And she started praying for me. She started praying for my wife. And within two years of her prayer, persistent prayer, within two years, listen to this. Someone came to my office. I was in business for 25 years. Never wanted to be a pastor. Never. Never wanted to serve the Lord. Just business. And this young girl came to my office. I mean, her eyes was full of the love of Jesus. And she says, I need to talk to you. I said, I can talk to you. I'm busy. She stayed there. She was persistent. She stayed there until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. She stayed there for six hours. And within five minutes as she walked into my office, I came to Jesus crying. The next day, this, this girl, I mean, God has an anointing over girls, over women that is amazing. I am Christian and I'm preaching the word of God because a woman prayed for me. And a woman preached to me. Praise the Lord. Persistent prayer. And then... The next day, she went to my house, and she, she called my wife and said, I need to talk to you. My wife, no, I don't want to talk to you. No, no, no way, no way. And she, she got into my house. You see, we, we lived in this place that had a security guard. Nobody could get in. She got in. <laughs> I asked her, her name is Wanda. How did you get in? She said, I don't know. I just told the guy I was going to go see your wife. She said, go ahead, and he opened the door. <laughs> she got in, and then she was knocking at the door, and my wife looked at him through, you know, through that little hole, and she, and she said, what is she doing here? And she started cussing, what is she doing here? Within five minutes inside my house, my wife was giving her heart to Jesus. And it was all because my sister was praying for me. She even gave me a car. 
She gave me a car, and, and I still have my, the, her car she gave me. He says, I had a prayer for you every day. I pray that one day you will serve the Lord. I pray that one day you will get to know his peace, his love, and his mercy. And I know that my Lord will answer my prayer. And I said, oh, my God, my wife, my, my sister is so aggressive. She really wants me to get into this religious weird stuff. She's so aggressive. I was a little bit scared of her. But let me tell you something. When you get a scripture from the word of God and you start praying it, praying and praying and declaring, praying, God will make justice. And if you have this morning here, you have a kid that is outside your home or maybe it's rebellious or whatever and you're worried about your family, don't worry just pray about it. Be persistent in your prayer about your loved one that God will bring justice to your house. Amen? Amen? Now, there's another scripture about persistence that, that I love. And this I'm going to read it to you because this one is so important. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. I have 10 more minutes, so 15 minutes, I guess. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. If we can see the scripture there, please, so we can all read it. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So he's talking about the church. The scripture is for us. But you, brother, be not weary in well-doing. You know, to be a good Christian, sometimes you get weary. When you start loving people, when you, when you start giving yourself, you get hurt. Not only within the world, but within the church, which is worse. Well, we must be persistent in doing good. We must be persistent in the well-doing. Now, uh, uh, well-doing is about acts of love. He's talking about in your actions represent my love. Let your actions reflect my actions. That even though I was denied by my own people, I still walk in love. That even though my own family didn't believe in me, I still walk in love. That even though there was so much resistance coming my way, when I was doing the will of my God or my Father, I still walk in love. You know, ask Jesus every day for a supernatural importation of his agape love. This is something that only God can do to us. We don't have the ability to develop this kind of love, but if you ask for it, he will give it to you. He's, he will impart us. He wants us to walk in love. You know, the love of agape is an unconditional love. The love of agape is uh, uh, that you want the wellness of others no matter what. We need agape love in our houses. I need agape love to love my wife. It's not only the, the eros, you know, the kissing and the stuff. It's not only that. It's not only the phileo. You know, oh, you look so pretty, you look so nice, it goes to the movie. It's not only that. I need unconditional love for my wife. I need unconditional love for my kids. And that is something that God can give us. Only God can give us. It, 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 God can change your heart. God changed my heart completely. If you would have met me 20 years ago, ask my wife. Are you kidding me? I was crazy. I didn't know what, how to love. I didn't know how to speak. We serve a God that his expertise is in changing the heart of humans. And some of you here need to, need to listen to this because your children, your wife, your people, even your employees need to know that you have a good heart. And this is something that comes from God. This is something that comes from above. So when it says that, do not be wary and well-doing, you know, ask, ask Jesus to give you this kind of love. Ask Jesus to give you an anointing to be generous. Generous. The world is the opposite of generosity. The world is all about me. 
What is it for me? How much money is for me? How can I look good? How can I be good? How can I be above everything? Competition, but not us. Us should be what is it for them? What is best for others? Ask the Lord to give you an anointing to be a giver. That you be happy. You know, I was reading a book the other day that it was telling that the happiest people in earth are the ones who give the most. And it's so true. And ask the Lord to be a giver. You know, put God first in all your resources. Put God first in your financial resources. Put God first in your time resource. Time is a great resource. Put time first in your talents, in your gift. And above everything, put God first in your decisions. And be a giver. You will be happy when you're a giver. Well doing, you know, is what about what can I give to others? How can I bless others? You know, in our churches, uh, we're in Miami. And there's a huge uh, growth of Hispanic population in Miami. Um, you hardly speak English anymore in Miami. And uh, we have church, we have new, new uh, people coming to our church all the time. And we have a lot of women that, that they're alone. They're very smart, very talented. I love to preach to women. I love it. And, uh, and uh, they're so smart, they're so talented, and they're alone. And they come into our church, and when they see my wife with uh, smiling, and we hug them, and we welcome them, uh, they feel so good about themselves. Most of these women, I would say 80% of these women, they become business people. Successful business people. They don't even know English. And they're alone. But they find the love of Jesus. They find the identity of Jesus. And they become leaders. And it's all because someone gave them the love of Jesus. Because someone gave them the smile of Jesus. Because someone gave them the hug of Jesus. Well doing. Perseverance in well doing. Give. It's not about yourself. It's about others that will make you happy. And number three, I want to talk to you about persistent in forgiving. We need to forgive every day. Because when you love and when you give, trust me, you're going to be hurt. And forgiving is something that we need to be persistent on it. Um, the person that get you, that hurt you the most, is usually the one that you love and that you give yourself the most. And um, that's part of life, let's face it. And be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. Don't hold it. Forgiving will reflect the heart of the Father. And forgiving will protect you. Forgiveness is for your own good. It will protect you. And forgiving uh, will make that God will bless you. And uh, he will exalt a forgiver. When, you, when we walk in, for, in, in a forgiving spirit, Jesus will exalt us. Even if you don't want to, he still will. You know, be persistent in good works. Because persistence pays off. Persistent pays off. Persistent pays off. Jesus talk about it constantly. Talk about it. It's not only to persevere. Yeah, I'm going to persevere being a Christian. I'm going to persevere in the promises of God. But what are you going to do every day? What are your daily actions? What is your persistence about it? Don't stay home. You know, come to church. Don't just say, I'm not going to serve anymore because I serve and I got hurt. So what? Forgive and start serving again. If people hurt you and people doesn't like you, this is the perfect excuse just to serve them even more. And be persistent in forgiving. You know, forgiving is the number one um, tool. You, call it, you can call it like that. The number one tool or the number one necessity in a marriage is not love, it's forgiving. Why are you so quiet now? But Pastor Frank, why do you say that? Because my wife forgave me so, so many times. 
And because she forgives me so many times, I can love her back so many times equally. Amen? Persistence. Persistence. Amen? Amen. That is my message this morning. I tell you, that's so good because it's just so real, persistent, especially in forgiveness. I forgive you for taking me to that boxing match. <laughs> no, no. Don't go. go away, Frank. Don't go away. Um, what do you say? Did you get something out of that? God is good. Man, that was, that was an excellent word. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good. Excellent. I'm just so happy to be able to come into the house of God and hear the word of the Lord so consistently here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Those of you that may or may not know, he was talking about, some of you don't even know this, there's a conference uh, called ISOM Conference. It's our missionary conference. It's taking place all week long. We've had over 200 uh, missionaries from all over the world here, from China, from uh, Russia, uh, from uh, all parts of the world, the Amazon jungle. These people live in the Amazon jungle on the rivers, building, literally building boats to, to, to reach the people. And so when he mentioned he's here for that conference, he spoke at the conference last night, and I grabbed him for this morning and tomorrow morning. And that conference, as we're speaking, is in one of the rooms down here in Children's Church and is meeting there, and that's taking place. And we're honored uh, to have uh, and be the host of of uh, so many great missionaries all over the world. And uh, we want to pray for you for, for your trip to uh, Cuba. And so, Father, I just lift up my brother Frank to you. And we're all in a... Jim, on, raise your hands towards Frank. We're all in agreement, Lord, that he's going to have supernatural doors opened. We thank you, Father, that you open doors that no man can open and close doors no man can close. And God, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor this is a great man of God, Lord. This is a man that you can use, you can trust. He can go forward. He can bring the wisdom of God to a lost and dying world that needs Jesus desperately. And they're so ignorant, they don't even know that they need Jesus. So forgive them, Lord. But I thank you, God, for the anointing that opens all the doors that need to be done. And I thank you, God, for the protection upon him and his family and as, as he travels and all the people that go with him. And Father, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. With a great big shout, we say amen. amen. I want to make sure everybody's all right with before you leave. I want to be persistent at what I'm doing right now. Because there may be those of you that are not right with God. Do you know what that means when you're not right with God? That means you walk out of this place. And if your heart stopped and you died, you'd go to hell. God, did you just hear what I said? That means you walked out of this place because you're not right with God. And if your heart stopped and you died, you'd end up in hell. You'd open your eyes in hell. Oh, my goodness. Nobody wants that. But I want to make sure that you're right with God so that if anything does happen, you end up in heaven and not hell. It's a very real place, heaven and hell. And you can make the decision on where you're going to end up. And God gives you the power to do just that, to make the choice. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get to heaven? I thought I'd get there because I'm a good person. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible it says you get to go to heaven because you're nice? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible it says you get to go to heaven because you love God, supposedly? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you a Christian when you were a kid? Maybe took you to catechism or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Maybe you had a bumper sticker on your car that says, you know, I'm a Christian's not perfect or whatever those bumper stickers are, just forgiven. That won't get you to heaven. Did you know that? Nope, won't get you to heaven. Doesn't make you a Christian. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That means you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. 
And Jesus makes this statement, and he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in John third chapter. He says these words, you must be born again. I know that when I use the word born again, everybody turns off. They think born again people are idiots and fanatics and weirdos. And you know why you think that? Because Hollywood has portrayed them for years in movies as jerks and goofballs and fanatical radical people. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again means something. Let me tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It's simple. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. Listen to me. It always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you by the scripture itself, by the words of Jesus, all or nothing. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, that's the last book in the Bible and you've heard of it. And he makes this statement himself. He says, when I come again, and you know he is, he says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a blunt and even rude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. But do you know what he really just said by making that statement? Here's what he really meant by making that statement. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to vomit you out of his mouth. Lukewarm people that call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all. That's what that means. So what's lukewarm? Let me, let me define what lukewarm is. Little in, little out, little up, little down. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God. No, no, you're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something. Can I tell you something? It doesn't work that way. Until you make him everything, he'll never be something. You know, it's very important. You go to church once in a while, you have a token prayer, but you're not wholehearted for God, that's lukewarm. And some of you need to hear this today because your eternal life is at stake and you do not want to all of a sudden find yourself opening your eyes in hell. Today you want to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. Notice how I emphasize the word give because he's not a thief. He won't rob your heart and life. It's yours. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it and into it. He's not a manipulator to hit you in the head with a two by four and make you do this. It's your call. It's your choice. God could have made robots that look exactly like you, a trillion of them if he wanted to, all to worship him. But he doesn't. He made you just the way you are, unique. And he also gave you the free will choice to either give him all of your heart or not give him all of your heart. It's your call. I can't make you do it. Your neighbor can't make you do it. It's got to come from your heart that you give God all of your heart. You give God all of your life. Because it's in that all or nothing giving of your heart and life that you become born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Someone needs to love you enough and respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. And today, here I am. I love you, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I give God all of my heart? How do I give him all of my life? Well, let's don't do it my way or your way. Let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In other words, in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, three. And when I say three, I'll pop my hands on this pulpit like this. Bang! I'll go one, two, three. Bang! When I hear, you hear that sound, Bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. Because I already know you know who Jesus is. But you can't get to heaven because you have head knowledge of who he is. So I already know you know who he is. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want him in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Today, I want to become a child of God. Today, you're going to have to do this. 
Maybe you've prayed with Billy Graham on television or at a Harvest Crusade. But did you follow up that prayer with all of your heart and all of your life? Or was it just some magical abracadabra formula you called a prayer that you repeated? Maybe today you've been running from God instead of to God. Get ready to put your hand up. Maybe you've never really given him all of your heart. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Maybe you've never given him all of your life. Get ready to put your hand up. You say, Pastor, if I put my hand up, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe place than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. No one's that dumb, so don't let anybody talk you out of it. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here. You have a divine appointment with God. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands down on this pulpit. You get your hand up. Let me see it. Put it right back down. Who cares what anybody else says? Let's get going with God. Let's give him all of our heart. Give him all of our life. All across this auditorium, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, in the foyer, by television, wherever you're watching, today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Back over on this side. Anybody? I didn't see anybody on this side back here. There's eleven wise people. Anybody else? There's there's another one. Oh, I got you right there. God bless you. Put your hand up. Twelve. God bless you. Thank you. There's another one here. Thirteen. Four. I already think I already got you guys. I don't want to count you again, but I think I already got you. There's twelve or thirteen wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, what do you say? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 12 or 13 wise people. Isn't God good? All 12 or 13 of you, if you raised your hand and you're serious about God, if you raised your hand and you're serious about God, let me talk to you just for a moment. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. I want you to get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to get a friend. I want you to get in the aisle, bring your stuff, bring a friend if you need to. Meet me right here in front. We're going to pray together. Well, it's no weird stuff goes on. If you're in the foyer or in the, in the uh, family rooms, bring your children. You just come right now because we're all going to stand. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. I want every one of you that raised your hand and you're serious about God. I want you to get out of your seat, bring a friend. Come on, get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. The reason that I live come on, you come too. Just come. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, you just come right now. Come on. Come on, anybody else? Hurry, 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 hurry. Are they coming? Oh, great. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, we'll wait for you. While they're coming, you can come too if you need to come. Come on. Well, thank God, you guys. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God you have come. I want you to take a look over to your left. See this guy waving everywhere. His name is Pastor Joe. Pastor Joey is a great man of God. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to take home. Now that you're a Christian, what in the world does God want you to do now that you'll be a Christian? That literature will help you to define that. Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll explain what that means. It means you meet somebody before church service. They help you get strong. They pray for you. They meet you so you don't go back and fall through the cracks going back doing the same old junk. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. That's what this is all about. You said you're going to give God all of your heart. 
You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do what Pastor Frank said. Be persistent in your walk with Jesus. Not just emotionally coming up, but persistent year after year after year committed to the Lord. Joey will help you to do that. Pastor Joseph will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joseph right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.